there's someone moving to our flank in the in the wadi and i see the head bobbing along but we're getting actively engaged from one location so i i keep engaging and as i keep looking over my in my peripheral i can see the guy's head pop up a couple times and the last time his head pops up i see the rpg come up with him and the last thing i remember was saying oh as he fired it and it had hit the 240 that i was gunning Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve Warzone Tours as an Army Attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the combat story of Jeff Adamek, a longtime Green Beret with six combat deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan as an 18 Bravo and K-9 handler with 3rd Special Forces Group. Jeff earned the Silver Star during the Battle of Debeka Pass in Iraq in 2003 during his first deployment. In his final deployment, Jeff was knocked unconscious by an RPG during a gunfight in Afghanistan while based out of Fob Cobra. He broke his back in four places and was medically retired for those injuries and the TBI sustained as a result. Despite that, he went on to find success in the corporate sector, network engineering and logistics, and hosts the Hearts and Minds podcast that focuses on military history of all eras prior to 1995. Jeff's understanding of military history and weaponry absolutely shines through in this episode. Just see what he's talking about with the Javelin and will, I hope, attract some more listeners to his podcast. And I hope you enjoy this fast paced and wide ranging interview with Jeff as much as I did. Jeff, thanks for uh, taking the time to share your story with us. Hey, thanks a lot for having me on, man. I really appreciate uh, the time with you guys today. So our, our connection was an interesting one, and I just wanted to to share this a little because I, I hope that this happens a bit more often, not just with people like us who have programs like Combat Story or Hearts and Minds, but just in general, veterans who are out there. Um, you know, you mentioned that you do your own program but your family hasn't heard your story necessarily. And I, I always worry, and I get messages all the time of family members who have you know, passed on and the family never heard a lot of these stories that we're able to share today. And I know it's different generationally, but you know, could you just share a little bit more context there as, as we connected? Yeah, sure. So uh, because, I, because the show I host, it's a, it's a military history podcast. And one of the the rules that I have for the show is that I don't ever go into anything that happened during my lifetime, or at least during the time where I was active duty in the military, because I believe that people have a certain view of history. And a lot of times that'll change over time as people learn more about it. And you know, as well as I do, that a lot of the stuff that is incorporated with our history may or may not be public domain. They may not know the truth on the ground behind a lot of stuff. So also I felt it was a little self-serving for me to talk on my show about my own stuff. Uh, and I definitely wanted to make sure I kept a little bit of the quiet professionalism associated with that show. So I made a rule with my, with my co-host that we would never cover anything from 1995 on. And what happened was when I first got out of the military back in 2013, my, my son had just started high school. My daughter was just coming of age where she kind of understood the world around her. And I realized that my son had very fleeting rem- memories of my service and my daughter had absolutely none. And over time, it's never been brought up. It's You know how it is. We don't really talk about ourselves a lot in those aspects unless it's at a party with our friends. But the kids are normally not around when everyone's sitting around the fire drinking. And what I realized a couple months ago was I was driving with my daughter from a cheerleading practice. And she had mentioned that someone that she had been in the cheerleading, cheerleading with, their father knew me. And she said that this girl started going on and on about some of the stories that she had heard from her father about my daughter's father. And she's like, I never knew this stuff. So my, my daughter was completely convinced that I did something in the army, like I was a, a cook or a supply sergeant because of my job now. And I, I had to, I realized that my kids know nothing about the story behind some of the things that, that I was in, involved in. And I wanted to uh, give them the opportunity to have somewhere where they could go and, and hear from their father's mouth without sounding like he was promoting himself um, to talk. So I reached out to you and I said that I, I'd be interested in coming on. And I'm not ashamed of saying that because I think that the more we talk about our stories and get them out there, the more it, yep. it helps people bring awareness to our culture, the things we've done and, and the history of our own country, really. Yeah, no, that's awesome. It, it's such a good story. And I think 
maybe our generation is just a little better about talking about some of these things now. And it wasn't, a, you know, it was almost taboo in the past, but right. I definitely remember talking to my dad about like asking him, you know, he wouldn't bring it up, but just asking him about, Hey, Vietnam, tell me a little bit more about that and what happened there. So I'm glad we're doing this and thank you for reaching out. And, and you know, quite frankly, I was like, hell yeah, I'll take this. I mean, this sounds like <laughs> a great story. You understand the podcast side of things and what this is like, and you've been there and done that. So thank you so much for that. And then the, one of the other things, you know, for people who are, uh, who are listening and not watching, you can't see, but behind Jeff, he's got Star Wars posters, different, uh, maybe comic book covers. Yeah. There's some Star Wars. Star Wars. I, I am a, I am an un, unapologetic geek. Uh, and I think that that goes into a lot of my backstory, which I think a lot of people out there are going to relate to is to, as, as, as well, you know, already, uh, the story of how I got interested in being in the military. Yeah, is that's what by far most people, ridiculous. most people will say that some type of movie or book kind of like piqued their interest in the military, but usually it's like a really military specific, <laughs> right. you know, it's a, it's a Black Hawk down. It's a. Uh, you know, saving private Ryan, yours is different. And I definitely wanted people to hear this because it struck me. <laughs> sure. So you it's want me alien. To go into it now? Yeah. yeah, no, I would love for, yeah. So, yeah, so Aliens um, the movie. Yeah. So I, I grew up in New Jersey. I'm originally from New Jersey. And uh, as we were talking about, I, I was lower, upper, upper, lower class. Uh, basically, I had, I come from a Navy family. My, my grandparents were Navy. My, my father was Navy, but um, growing up in, in New Jersey in the 80s, you know, late 70s, 80s, early 90s, it, it was not a great place to, you know, we, we had our own struggles, you know, culturally, there were, there were a lot of alcoholism and stuff like that in people's families, and, and we struggled as a family to, to make things meet. So I dove myself knee deep into movies, uh, as, as a lot of young, under athletic individuals do. And 1986, the movie Aliens came out, and, and I had never seen the first movie. But uh, a couple friends of mine were like, well, we're going to go see this. We want, you know, our dad's going to take us. And my parents didn't care. So uh, the only thing I remember my mom saying is, as I left the house was, um, I don't want to hear you complain tonight when you're having nightmares about this movie. But once I got there and, and I had seen other military based movies before, sure, you know, because I loved, I loved action flicks, loved sci fi stuff. Um, but there was something about the movie Aliens and, and the Colonial Marines in, in general, um, Hudson Hicks and all those characters that when I walked out of the theater, I had this thing in my head at, you know, at nine, 10 years old that I was like, that's what I, I want to be those guys, you know, not losing and killed by some alien from another planet. But I wanted to be members of that kind of like they were everything that I'd seen in movies about military, but there was just something so totally cool about what they did and and how they reacted with each other and the and the kind of the partnership and brotherhood that they all had with each other. And so that movie in my mind made me want to be a Marine so bad that everyone that I told about it looked at me like I was out of my mind. They're like, you know, funny now, they're, they're like, Space Force doesn't exist. You know, there is no Space Force. Now, now there is, and it's good. Took me right, I got out of the military and then Space Force started up. So, but yeah, that, that was the movie that got me into wanting to be in the military. It was Aliens. And I tell people that all the time. It wasn't, it wasn't any of the Heartbreak Ridge, although that's one of my favorite movies and, or Platoon or any of those movies. Yeah. It, was, it was a science fiction movie uh, because obviously, as you can see behind me, um, I'm a science fiction geek that from the, you know, I was born in 1977. I tell people all the time, I only exist in this planet to make sure someone says a fan of Star Wars because I came out the same year that Star Wars did. <laughs> ah, I love it. it. You know, you brought up something funny where you said, um, you know, obviously you don't want to get killed by aliens. And I was just thinking about this the other day because Black Hawk Down was really influential for me. I was already on the path to be in the army, but like I saw that and I go, I'm going into aviation. But in retrospect, it's not the greatest outcome for us no you know? but no, it really it's something isn't. about the None brotherhood and like the action the adventure that you're like yeah how do i get into that i really i really do believe that it has to do with not just our inter in interpretation of what we see on the screen but the crowds and the people around us and and like you you go out of a movie uh for example the first blood right uh, here's a movie about a green beret pretty much other than the green beret is the only movie that had special forces a green beret in it and that movie is not something that you watch and say i want to be that guy I and mean, you have a guy who's a uh, struggling with ptsd gets treated poorly in this, some town and, and has to revert back to his unconventional warfare tactics and in the end in the original as other some people know who read the book in the end of the story he doesn't survive and so the movie was made a little bit different and it was obviously an uh, from what I understand was an apology from Sylvester Stallone to to the veteran community for 
being a protester during the Vietnam War. Uh, but though, yeah, they don't really end great for the people in these movies that we that we watch and then inspire us to join the military or want to be in the military. But that's kind of what makes being in the military so important to people is there really is a, a expectation that you, you're not it may not be a good outcome for you, yeah. but yet you do it anyway. And that's what makes us a different breed, I think, than other people. Do you notice that in your podcast, given the fact that you go back and look at military history? Is this a pretty consistent theme, you would say? Yeah, I'd say so. And, and it's even more consistent when you look historically, because uh, I don't know if it's, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking or, or hindsight is better vision, but you look at some of these things that say the Civil War, or World War II, and some of the situations that, that these people willingly put themselves in to fight the enemy or, or to defeat the enemy or to stand up to the enemy, even when there was no way out. Uh, it, to me, it just, it, I get moments where I'm like, well, why would, why would you do that? <laughs> yeah. What, what, what made you think that that was a good idea? And, and then you look back at some of the things that we've done in our service in combat. And, and then I realize that we're, we're not any different, but it's the same thing because I be honest with you, as cool as my stories are, when I look back on my stories now as an older person, I look at a guy who had no regard for his own safety or his own life. And I'm like, my God, man, uh, you did things that nowadays I don't think I would do. So, yeah, for sure. Jeff, there are going to be people looking back one day and saying, why the hell did Jeff do that? I mean, we're going to get into some of this. I know. Um, okay. So colonial Marines initially, and then, uh, you kind of had the Navy family, this Marine focus, but you end right. up, and we're going to talk about you being in special forces in the Army side of the house. Where does that transition come? So I, being someone who was very interested in movies, uh, I had gone to a performing arts program in New Jersey to high school. So I gotten very involved in, in uh, musical theater and stuff like that. And uh, I applied for and got into a publicly ran performing arts program in New Jersey, which happens to be the same exact program. And I graduated the same year as uh, Cal Penn, the guy that was in Carol and Kumar go to White Castle. So me, me and him both graduated together. Uh, having said that, my parents, as, I, as I've mentioned, were not very supportive, nor did they care about a lot of the stuff that I did. It was a very 80s type family environment where the parents were off doing their own thing, latchkey kids, not having anything to do with the parents or them being involved in the children. And they just didn't see, like most parents didn't see back then, any reason to pay for me to go to college to be Wow. in acting or anything because you know it's you're you're asking to go into an environment where you're likely not going to be employed and so i understand it uh having said that i didn't have any way of getting into college they weren't going to pay for it i was not the best student even though i was good at acting and singing and all that other stuff but i was not a stellar performer so there was no no one was knocking down my doors trying to give me a a scholarship for things i played sports but i wasn't necessarily the best i didn't even start in high school on on baseball or football even though i was on the teams I decide I'm going to join the military, and that goes back to aliens. I wanted to be a Marine so bad, but I was 17 years old, and I was going to be 17 for the first – because I was an August baby. I was going to be 17 well into being out of high school for like another eight months. And so I go to the Marine recruiter, and I say, look, I can't be infantry. My parents will never sign off on that. Uh, the closest thing I could see from movies that is in the infantry is radio communicators and medics. And I didn't want to have anything to do with anything electric because I'm just not a big fan of electricity at the time. Funny. Uh, but then I go, I, I could be a medic. That sounds – I can convince my parents and I drive an ambulance or something. So I say, I want to be a medic in the Marines. And then the Marine recruiter looks me in the face and he says, we don't have medics in the Marine Corps. All our medics come from the Navy. And that immediately set up a red flag for me because I had – growing up in New Jersey on the shore, I never got anywhere near used to being in the ocean. Didn't want to have anything to do with – jumping into an environment where now I wasn't the top of the food chain anymore. There was nothing about it. There was no, I never watched movies about the Navy when ships were sinking and ever got the, the misunderstanding that I wanted to join that service and drowned. So I was like, I can't do it. I cannot join the Marines because my parents won't sign off on it. You don't have medics. I don't want to be in the Navy. Get joined up to be a corpsman with the Marine Corps, but then get stuck on a ship somewhere. I walk out, my head down as I'm walking by the Army recruiter's office this guy was like, he was waiting. He could hear the whole conversation going on in the Marine Corps because it was all in the same building in New Jersey. And he says, hey, you want to be a medic? I'm like, yeah, but I, I, I want to be an infantry. I want to do something cool. I'm like, I want to do something like jump out of airplanes. And he goes, oh, because what if I gave you an airborne contract and a medic? I was like, I'll sign it right now if you do that. I'll sign it today. And then I explained to him the thing about my parents, and 
he drove me home, walked in with, and told my parents that they didn't have to pay for college, that they weren't going to pay for anyway, and that I would be a medic in the, in the Army. And then he convinced them that I was going to be an ambulance driver and that I was going to jump out of planes as, as a side project kind of thing. And so that's how I got an airborne contract to join the Army in 1995 as a medic and ended up in the 82nd Airborne Division at first, which that's you know, great. infantry. <laughs> so so how did your parents react? When, when they heard you were going in? Again, there was a lot of indifference. Um, they, they, I guess they were, they were happy that I had some kind of a plan. Uh, they had figured they had gotten out of having to pay for college I didn't want to pay for anyway. So, you know, it's, you know, my parents were proud that they had someone in the family in the military. But again, my parents were a little bit more, we, we, had, we had a lot of problems uh, growing up in, in, you know, not being in a, in a high economic class uh, in New Jersey during the, the late 80s when things were going on. The 90s had just come around, and now their son is a Gen Xer who listens to Nirvana all day, spends all of his time skateboarding or at, or at school doing plays, and now he doesn't want to have, you know, we, you know as well as I do, our disconnect between baby boomers and Gen X. I think, yeah. it's the, I think it's one of the largest, it's almost as bad as the greatest generation in baby boomers, where there's a separation. We've got you know, the hippies turned into yuppies and then we came along and we were all depressed and angry at the world. And, you know, we didn't share or talk anything with our parents a lot. So I, I think they were proud of my service um, ultimately, but I don't think at the time, it, it, I really don't think it affected them one way or the other. So it was all, anything I did was all on just for, just for me at the time. Yeah. When does the Green Beret side of things, um, when do you start thinking about it? Cause I know you spend a few uh -oh. years before you go to assess, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. So I joined the army and I had this real big problem with self-confidence and, and having the feeling that I could obtain anything that was outside of my realm of, of what I expected to be my abilities. So because I wasn't a good athlete in school and because I was dead set on just making it to airborne school, airborne school at the time for me was not hard at all. And I thought to myself, well, this wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. Uh, maybe I could be somebody like a ranger or a special forces guy. So as I'm leaving airborne school to go to Fort Bragg to go to the 82nd, I sign up for a, you know, if you want rangers, I'll join the rangers. And I forget about it. And I forget about it for three years. Now, in that three years, I'm in the 82nd. I mean, I'm a medic in the 82nd. Now I've met, met a woman and gotten married, which is the ultimate, you know, young army person's deal when they're enlisted. <laughs> Note to self, uh, spoiler alert, same, still married to the same woman. So, uh, it just, I just, that I is not common. Lucky. That's that not, is common, not common. Yeah. yeah. I, I got it. And I'll go into that a little bit later as to how people always say, how many wives do you have? And I say, just one. And they, people will freak out about it. Cause it's like, you're a green brave with just one wife. I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> yeah. anyway, I meet my wife. I, I get married. And then all of a sudden a, a month after we get married, I get this letter saying I'm being levied. And when you're in the 82nd, you get levied. For those who are in the military, they know this. Normally, you think, you're, oh, man, I'm going to Korea for a year. And I look at it, and it says I'm being levied to Fort Lewis, Washington. And immediately once I saw that, I knew. I knew that I was going to Ranger Battalion because that's the only reason I would be going to Fort Lewis, Washington was go to 2nd Ranger Battalion. So I go down to the levy office at Fort Bragg, and I asked them. I said, hey, I got this letter in the mail saying that I'm being levied. I'm like, do you have, do you have me on orders to go to RIP? Because I knew you had to go to RIP at the time. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, you've been on orders to go to RIP for six months. It's like, thanks. It, and I'm like three weeks away from it. So I had no prep time to get ready for RIP after being in the 82nd for two, three years. And I go to RIP, and thank God at the time, they really needed medics. So so as much as I was struggling behind the guys who were coming right out of infantry, basic, I still was able to pass RIP. And I got sent to Fort Lewis, Washington, and did I did uh, three years there at 2nd Ranger Battalion. Uh, before my wife said she wanted to come back as her family lived here at Fort Bragg. Her dad was retired military. Uh, we came back, and within four months of me being back at Fort Bragg and already getting that whole mindset of rip wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. It was tough, but not as hard as I thought it was going to be. I started getting more confidence and, and getting myself mentally to the point where I realized that it's not so much whether or not you're physically able to do something up front. It's whether or not you're willing to quit or not willing to quit something. It's like, if I get in my mind that I want to do something, I am not going to self-select my way out of it by telling myself I can't do it. I'm going to make the people who make those decisions tell me that I can't do it. And then I'm going to tell them that I don't care and, and push my way through it and do everything I can. And that's everything I did in the army up to that point has led me to realize I can do more than what I was doing. 
get back. I'm not happy with being back in 82nd because it's not special operations. My wife's like, why don't you just go to selection? Because she had known for years, every time special forces got mentioned, you know, I was like, oh, John Wayne, Green Berets, everything. I was, everything about me was Green Berets, Green Berets, Green Berets. And so I decided to go to selection and, and I went out to selection and funny story, went two months before they changed selection to a two week selection instead of four weeks, which I used to always tell everyone, I know I went to the last hard class like everybody, but I legitimately did go to the last hard class. And I am not, I am willing to admit that if I had known that I'd have waited two months and gone to the first easy class because that, hard, that, hard, that class was hard. And uh, I got selected and, and then got to go to the Q course uh, right about the time that uh, George, George Bush was being elected. And so uh, as everyone who could put two and two together is I was going through the Q course when 9-11 happened. As a matter of fact, I was in phase, phase one out at Camp McCall and watched everything that happened on 9-11. I saw three weeks later when I got out of isolation and came back. So like, so I, you didn't hear about everything. it at all, Jeff? We heard about it. We, we had heard about it. We were listening to it on our Syngars radios. We can t- tune into NBC and we listened to everything that was happening, but everything we heard was all, was all audio. And, and I don't know if it does me a benefit or not, but things like seeing people have to jump from the towers and all those, that horrific stuff. Uh, my wife had watched and and I did not. And, and by the time I'd gotten out of the out of phase one, a lot of that stuff had seen its last moments on television and wasn't being shown a lot. So I didn't see a lot of the horrific stuff that people saw. I've seen everything that I would say my kids have seen. Yeah. Like they turn on the TV and watch all the replays, but I heard it when it was happening. I just didn't see it. So So uh, I talked to a couple folks who've been in training during the that event and I think almost every time they think this is like a psyop that's being run against them in the training uh, course. We, did you guys think that? We did think that at first. We we were getting ready to go out on our first three day field exercise, and we had gone and had breakfast. We were standing in line to get our MREs uh, issued to us, and one of the other students had gone into the cafeteria out at Camp McCall to pick up coffee or something for the instructors. And he had saw it on the TVs. And when he came out, it had already been going around that this had happened. And so people were like, man, this is, they're just messing with us. They're trying to get us in this mindset of they're setting it up for the field, for the final field problem thing, that this is going to be what we're doing. And he comes out and he, he was bawling. I mean, just completely crying because wow. his, his mother had worked at the Pentagon. And he had said, uh, hey, this just happened. I saw it on the news inside the cafeteria. So we all start moving towards the chow hall at Camp McCall and the instructors are coming out of the chow hall with their hands out. They're like, guys, don't go in there, go back. You're going to continue training. And we had done our three day field problem. And at the end of the three day field problem, they had called us all into, into the main uh, class area there at, at McCall. And they, they had broken to us that anyone that was thinking this was still a psyop, it was not, this was real. And then believe it or not, the, Exodus began. We had people who wanted to go back to their old units because they thought their old units were getting on planes while they spoke to go to war. And so we had a lot of guys quit. Funny thing is one guy that quit that we tried to talk out of it. Uh, I had saw him again two years later, right after I got back from Iraq, um, still at Camp McCall guarding the gate because he had been, because he quit. They put him on gate guard duty and he never made it back to his unit, never made it there, never made it into the into the unit at all. And I and I told them then, I'm like, man, do you regret? He's like, yeah, I regret. I regret, you know, quitting that day because it, it didn't lead me back to my unit who had already been back and forth to Afghanistan twice by that point. And he was still on gate guard out of Camp McCall. So I, I wanted to ask, because you mentioned that going into the army, you didn't have much confidence. And I, I feel like that's, it's a bit surprising given that you're kind of performing almost like in terms of confidence, you played sports. You said you weren't as great at them as, as maybe some others, but you were in this kind of performing arts school. Where did the lack of confidence come from for you? Or what, what was it about the army that built it up for you? So physical ability was not something I was, I was naturally born with. And in having a son now, I realized that it had a lot to do with the fact that my parents didn't push me to play sports early. Um, I never really developed as a young person with any kind of physical capabilities uh, and everything physically was a struggle for me. I'm not a Got good it. runner. Uh, now I'm much like Shrek is when he talked about it. I can rucksack people under the ground. I can, I can, and then even almost silted today, even with my, my injuries, but running was not something that was, that I was strong with. And coming in probably the same time you came in, you remember that the army used to be all about running. 
you know, it was like, if you couldn't run, it didn't matter. You know, Afghanistan changed a lot of that perception of, you know, the difference between being able to walk up mountains with heavy weight or being able to run for a long time. And so having that kind of mindset and being in that army, uh, you know, with, you know, a range of battalion, everything was all about how fast you ran and, you know, yeah. run, running, running a, a 12 minute mile, which for me, a 12 minute, two mile, which for me was the fastest I had ever run when I was at range of battalion, getting ready to go to ranger school was uh, that was like an achievement for me that I never thought I'd make because I just wasn't a good runner. But yet we had guys that I was in the platoon with who were running sub tens. And I was like, I was like, what? but they, but those guys couldn't do, they couldn't do 50 sit-ups. And, you know, I was maxing sit-ups and push-ups every time I did it. So I, I think, I think that my success is in the military. And the more that, like I said, the more that I saw that I was doing things that I expected to be hard, did not seem as hard to me in, yeah. in, you know, on hindsight, that I was willing to go out and start taking bigger and better chances. And I think the fact that I had developed late as a leader in the army, because showing up at Ranger Battalion as an E4 without a Ranger tab, I, I did not get to E5 as fast as I, I should have, because they're not going to promote you in Ranger Battalion unless you have a Ranger tab. Getting back to the 82nd after being a Ranger Battalion, I started to be promoted fairly quickly and started to be given more and more leadership roles. And I, and I think that my leadership abilities began to develop among more professional people rather than that standard private sergeant, lieutenant, re regular army. And yeah. uh, I realized once I got into special operations that that, that thinking outside the box and, and be, being an anti, anti, you know, standardized, anti, you know, organizational person and, and that kind of stuff was, was where I belonged. And I think I really found a place that I could grow in and, and do well at. And you mentioned, so you get through uh, selection, you're in the course when you're in the Q course, right? When, uh, when 9-11 happens, when you come out of that, you end up going to third group. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and that was, that was by, that was by choice, which was also very strange. So my wife, uh, again, she'll come up a lot. Uh, she has a lot to do with, with the kind with the person I am today. And, and I mean that in every aspect of, of my being. She, she definitely is the person who stayed with me, put up with me coming from a military family. She knew certain things she also knew the history of special forces and being on fort bragg at the time with third group and seventh group everybody wants to go to seventh group because we had just had the, the 80s happen and and all the stuff in south america and everyone down there is still operating in, a, in almost like a, a combat environment because of things in colombia and, and the drug war and everything but she also knew that a lot of guys in that unit had another set of families down down range and a lot of those guys went through many wives so she had really told me she's like you are not to go to seventh group she goes do not put that on your list of where you want to go and she, and i didn't want to leave fort bragg because a lot of people hate bragg and, and they don't like it i have found that fort bragg is fantastic if you're if you're family oriented and we had we had had a, a son at that point and i really was focused on being a professional soldier who stayed at Fort Bragg as much as I could. So third group was the only other group at Fort Bragg, but 10th group was also the original special forces group. So I put down, I think third, 10th, third, like I put third down twice. And when the guys at the Q course saw me put third down, they were like, why would you want to go there? And this is all before 9-11 happened. Like, why, why would you want to go there? They don't get any more. They get the worst pay because they're still eating MREs and they go down range. Uh, they, they, they go to Africa, which a lot of people don't realize, but I, I loved going to Africa. I'd been on an MFO tour in the 82nd uh, in North Africa, and, and I loved it. And I wanted to go to, like, Kenya and, and Namibia and, and go to see all that stuff that you always see in movies. Again, movies. And so I wanted to go to third group, and then 9-11 and then happened, and then – Everyone wanted to go to third group, but then I got, I had already gone through the end of the Q course and almost everyone in my class went either to fifth or third. So it was, those were the two groups that they really were trying to overload with people because those were the two groups that were deployed the most at that time. What, so you mentioned the, their regional responsibility being Africa. What's, what was the reputation of third group at the time? It wasn't good. Uh, if you, if you speak to a lot of the guys who were, you know, pre 2001, uh, third group was the was the bastard children of of the special forces community. They were they were the youngest group. Uh, originally, they were just a training group during the Vietnam War that had been disbanded. Uh, so now you have you have SWIC, which is the Special Warfare Center in School. That was the replacement for third group. Third group was just where guys got trained at, and they reestablished third group in '91, uh, right after right at the beginning or right after the Gulf War, and 
those third group guys, I mean, the third group as a, as a unit had no combat to hang their hat on until the invasion of Iraq, um, in, in all actuality. So, uh, the fact that you had a lot of, they, they were the ones who got treated the worst by everyone else. Nobody wanted to be there. Nobody wanted to go to third group. That, that I think was, it was a different, different mindset and a different mentality and a different, totally different culture from most of the other special forces groups when I first got there. Got it. And just quickly, I, I know you don't end up, you, you probably didn't spend as much time in Africa as you were hoping with 9-11. Uh, zero. I, I, I okay. had zero deployments to Africa over 10 years. I was going to ask, did you ever make it to Tatooine in uh, Tunisia to to fulfill no, your Star Wars legacy? No, I, I sure didn't. But I did. I did get to go to Pinewood Studios once when I went to <laughs> went to England. So that that made up for it. Awesome. All right. Which so Pinewood Studios uh, is also where they filmed Alien. So it was a double whammy for me. Full circle. Full circle. Full circle. So talk us through. You get to the unit. I mean, it's post nine eleven. They're going um, right out of the gates to Iraq, though, as you alluded yeah. to, right? So talk us through that first time that that deployment for you. You'd already been in the army for a while. You just know, like nobody yeah. else, gone down range. Right? Yeah, I, I had been in the army for uh, I want to say seven or eight years at that point. And uh, one of the good things was that the the team that I had gone to had worked during Anaconda in in Afghanistan, but it was a very short deployment, and we were on on track to go to Afghanistan for a full six month deployment coming up in like that next September. But I got there in October of 2002 and October, November, sometime in there. And Christmas had come along. A lot of guys left. They came back and myself, uh, uh, two guys that I'd gone through the Q course with one was a medic. One was an 18 Charlie supply sergeant or engineer sergeant. And us three all got sent to the same, same team, which, was good for us because we had each other at least. And for those who don't know, when you first get to a special forces ODA, whether or not you are, you may be the most trained person in the army coming out of the Q course, but as far as the guys on the team are concerned, you're a new guy. So you're a E5 as I was at the time, or an E6, maybe even an E7. And you get to this unit and you're told immediately to shut up for the first year or until you have a combat deployment. So coming from the 82nd, coming from Ranger Battalion, I was very used to the whole, your new shut up, because it had happened to me over and over again. And I kind of gotten used to being happy with just being new and shut up, because at least nobody blamed you for anything when something went wrong, because you were just the new guy. They may have blamed you for how you did it, but no one ever blamed you for the decisions that were being made. And we get there, and there's a train up to go to Iraq, and 10th Group was given the the head up to take take on Iraq for the invasion, and it was... I bet apparently their commander, 10th Group commander, had sent a request to 3rd Group, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Group for a platoon of SF guys, or one company of SF guys to go forward with them to, to, to augment them. And our battalion commander decided that he didn't want to just send one company. So he, on his own, packed up the entire battalion and flew us to Romania. And I can, I remember, I remember walking off the plane and the eyes of the 10th Group command as they saw this entire battalion of SF guys show up when they only asked for a company, they, they weren't pleased. They weren't happy at all. So they were like, well, what do we do with all these guys? Well, uh, they're here, you know, the, the battalion commander and who I give a lot of credit to, you know, he forced his way into this with his whole battalion. What do we do with them? So they, they sent us all over the place. I had gotten sent for that. You know, we were there for two months before the invasion. I'd gotten sent in that two month time from one side of Romania to the other then we got sent down to to Cyprus for a couple of weeks, and you know, they were going to they were going to have us go in with with the SAS uh, to do uh, CSAR missions, but then that didn't work out. Then we ended up coming back, and one of the other company commanders had convinced 10th Group that they could utilize the the GMVs and the ground the ground mobility teams as like hunter killer teams, basically. What, what's and a GMV, what, Jeff? For people who don't know, uh, ground mobi mobility vehicles. It's basically the what you see when you look, when you turn on the television, you see the footage of the up armored um, crop top Humvees that you saw in Afghanistan or in Iraq back in you know 2002 2003. Only the special forces guys had those vehicles. They they were not widespread. You had the the shell tops or the standard Humvees for everybody else, and then the ground mobility vehicles, which were the special forces Humvees with the guns on the side. You know the the rolling the rolling porcupines with all the guns sticking out of them. Those really didn't exist for anyone but third group. 
they, we were really the only ones who had them. And that was our claim to fame, really, was that we had these mobility teams, these, these vehicle-mounted special forces teams. All their teams in 10th group were all, were all RUC teams or just Halo teams or just scuba teams, and we had these, these vehicles. So he did see us as maybe his, his unit's taxi drivers, so to speak. So we were able to prove that we could strip these down and get two of them on the back of a, C8, a C-130, and they could fly us in, you know, after they flew in all their 10th group guys. And, and that's what they did. And and two weeks before the ground war kicked off, we all flew in from Romania on, uh, you know, MH-130s, you know, loaded, loaded. <laughs> Funny story. The MH-130s got something like a 10,000 pound limit per vehicle, and they can only carry two vehicles. So we're running at like eight, you know, without all of our stuff in it. And then we, we had loaded up all these these brand new, these brand new equipment like the Javelin anti-tank system, which became important later, and and all this ammo and everything, and we were we were cruising about twelve thousand pounds, and and if we were not in Romania at that ex-Soviet base that was a you know the Soviet nuclear bomber base, which had like a mile and a half long uh, runway, we never would have got off the ground because the plane was bouncing and crashing as it was going down the runway till it finally took off, and when it got the map of the Earth as we were crossing the border. And they started trying to fly a map in the air. You could you could feel the pilots struggling to keep that plane in the air the whole time. And we have the blackout blackout windows are up. They've got all the all the the blankets put around everything. And and a lot of the guys had been deployed before, even if it was just Afghanistan for a couple months. They still had, could say that they were combat vets. But then there was us three who I, I graduated the Q course with. We were the three gunners, or or it was me and my medic was behind me in my vehicle and then the guy in front was the 18 charlie he was the gunner of the, the vehicle in front and i start seeing wh what looks like someone was taking photographs in the plane like i see flashes of light and i'm like what what is that and the crew chiefs are running back and forth up and down they were doing that the whole flight so it didn't seem weird and i grabbed one of them and i'm like hey man and i'm like i pull my my headset away from my ears and i'm yelling in his ear i'm like is someone taking photographs do we have a do we have some like press on the plane or something like that and he goes Oh no! Don't worry about that. That's just anti-aircraft fire. And I'm like, anti-aircraft fire. And I'm and I was all right with that. But I was like, hey, the anti-aircraft fire seems kind of bright. He's like, oh yeah, those are the rounds going through the fuselage. And I was like, I'm sorry. Did, what did you just say? And he said, yeah, those are the rounds going through the plane. And it wasn't until we land. And then I sat back in the in the turret and I was like, okay. And when we landed the next, you know, later that night, and the next morning we got off, we could see burn hole marks in the back of the Humvee where some of the rounds had come through. And it, it was, I was like, well, I get combat. Whew, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. All right. That's an interesting way to, to kind of get into sure theater. Was. Yeah, it was, right. it was. So you get there, um, as you said, the three of you, this is new for you. It's probably new for everybody being in Iraq though. Um, oh yeah, for sure. What's, yeah. What's the first uh, time you're outside the wire like for y'all? Well, we got there like late, late at night. They put us up in this, in this building. Um, you know, the, the Kurdish forces were on the ground there. We were in Northern Iraq. Uh, we immediately get dispatched to go out and link up with a team out in Halabja, Iraq. Now Halabja for the history buffs out there is the city that back in the, in the nineties, uh, Saddam Hussein gassed. And, you know, he gassed his own people. Everyone always says, oh, this is the guy who gassed his own people. Well, the city of Halabja is the city that this happened at. So we get there and kind of being someone, and FYI, I'm, I'm a huge, not just because I host it, military history podcast, but uh, I've been going to college for for a degree in history. I'm, I'm I was super into history, always had been, loved it. And I was like, oh, Halabja, this is where this happened. And we get there and it's desolate. There's like five people in the city. And that's because Saddam had killed everyone. And we linked up with 10th Group and we, we assisted them in an assault on an Ansar al-Islam uh, position on top of this hill near the, near the Iranian border. And that was our first experience in combat and my first experience with a Moab actually, because we used that during that, that mission. But we really didn't, it was very much like, there's the enemy up there two clicks away and, you know, um, they were firing at us yesterday, but we, we dropped a lot of ammo on them last night from planes, and we don't think they're up there anymore. And we got up there without a round being fired, and yeah, there was a couple of guys that were captured, and a, you know, a couple of a couple of guys who didn't make it 
from Anzwar al-Islam on top of the the hill, and um, it was my first experience seeing a, a what a what a U.S. military bomb will do, what a a Moab or, or a, a a JDAM will do to somebody, and that was all cool and everything, but and, and an experience that I won't forget. But it, it was nothing like what happened in April when we we finally get to Kirkuk and, or Missoula, and we were in Missoula, and we had been sitting at this was old girls school and we had set up our, our, our center of operations right there. And I guess the Kurds had been really pressuring the North or the North special operations command to get into the fight somehow, but they didn't want them crossing the green line, which was the line that separated Northern Iraq from Southern Iraq. And you have all these forces that are like absolutely cramming their way towards Baghdad. And there's a lot of victories being won. And you know, everyone knows the story, how quickly we were able to, to get, close in on Baghdad and, and overthrow the government. But they were getting, they felt a little left out. So they wanted to do something. And uh, so finally the commander says, well, there's these, this is Kurdish unit. We're gonna let them go and seize this little intersection at this town of Debeka. And the way they looked at it was, this town of Debeka was three miles away from the green line. It was close enough. It was gonna be, prob there'd probably be some some Iraqi, you know, Republican guard arm, armor there, but not a lot. Well, it'll be easy for us to get to go to go in there. We've already got a an SF team, a 10th group team, a, a split team sitting there already. They've been watching the intersection for a couple of days now. Things will be easy. So we move out that morning and it's two ODAs. So it was eight vehicles and a, an entire company of Kurdish f fighters. And we move and link up with ODA 044 from 10th group. And in this in this unit, was a guy that I had gone through the Q course with who was now in 10th group. He had got, he was one of the guys who went to 10th group. And then in the other third group team, the junior 18 Bravo, which was a weapons sergeant, which was what my MOS was, he also went to the same course, the same exact class. So we had three guys who had just graduated the same 18 Bravo class were the three junior weapons sergeants on this, on these three ODAs that were sent in to seize this intersection that they thought was completely just a, a random piece of ground. What no one had done was no one had taken. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You got a question? I just wanted to ask you mentioned the significance of the three of you having gone to that same course. Do you get pretty tight at that type of course? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, 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 uh, these are three people, me, uh, Jason Brown, and, um, and the guy from 10th group, um, who, who's still in. That's why I haven't said his name. Uh, he, he is, we, we are all three guys in a class of 20 people. Who had gone all the way wow. through the Q course together? So, uh, so you're we tight. had gone, yeah, yeah. We we had no, we knew each other uh, fairly okay. well. Um, and one of the things about that course was that it was the first course, if I remember correctly, that they they went into depth on the Javelin anti tank missile system. So no one had really been in, introduced to it. It had been around for a while, but it wasn't something that uh, that ruck teams, that guys that just walked, could carry with them because you know it's a man portable system, but you really can't carry the the actual launcher, the clue, and and then the rounds all around with you all the time. You, you, it's just not feasible for you to be doing that on, you know, as an SF team. So we were able to carry them around with us because we had the vehicles. And we get to this intersection that the command thinks is not important, but what they had failed to look at was the fact that this intersection was the intersection between Mosul, Kirkuk, and Baghdad. And there was this main highway that connected right there at Debeka that then went South Street to Baghdad. So it was massive, massively important for, for transportation and strategic operations. And for all their flaws and all their faults, it's their, it's their country. The Iraqis knew this as well as anyone else. So what they didn't know was there was an entire Iraqi armored division that was just south of the intersection that was the parent unit to the small little detachment of tanks that were active. A division. A division. So we go to seize this 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 ground for this uh, intersection that morning, and we're rolling. And we, as we're rolling, there's there's curves coming out of the woodwork, just joining this group. We didn't know at the time, but we had done a very good job of keeping the press from following us around. But word had got out that the Kurds were going to seize this intersection, and John Simpson and the BBC decided they were going to follow these guys to the to the to this battle and watch this battle unfold. But they got there late, which was and was not good for them. 
they we reach the intersection of Debecca and there's nothing there. I mean, there is a couple of behind us up on the hill at another intersection. There was a couple of abandoned tanks and then the actual intersection at Debecca, there was nothing. And we pull up in there and immediately after we get there, we get hit with some some mortar fire that was coming from the back of this mobile mortar unit, which was set up in the back of a vehicle. They would kind of drive, fire a couple shells, drive somewhere else, drop, drop a couple shells that were obviously pre pre positions because they were landing fairly, fairly close. And so as we're getting ready to maneuver on this mortar position, my team sergeant, who was the TC, the, the secondary uh, person in the vehicle that I was in, takes a look out across this big giant open valley that goes all the way south to this other ridge line that's probably five or six miles down. And he's looking down there and it's there's it's kind of foggy and he sees these silhouettes like in a line across the horizon just coming at us and he looks at them and I'll never forget is, is he had this really deep voice and he's like Jeff does, does that look like tanks? And it was like his voice broke and I look up and I pull up the binoculars and I immediately look through, and all I see is just like dust, this small little low silhouetted, and I go, fuck me, they are tanks. And that's when it started. Immediately, everyone in both units had had realized that, that these tanks were coming, and they, they were going at the, the mass speed that T-55 Soviet tanks could go. I believe there was a couple T-62s maybe, but basically mostly T-55s and some, some Soviet armored personnel carriers and and they they were coming at us and the Kurds, Sir, jeff was it was, a was it a setup was, was this kind of like a faint no we don't we don't yeah. believe it was a setup what we believe happened was uh they had identified that and then this is at the time this is what we thought yep. we had figured that they had the guys who were there at the intersection had broke broke contact and and, and hauled ass back to their division commander and he got, got there and found out that the kurds and this is what they said the Kurds were invading Debecca. And so he sent a company of his armored you know, fighters to go take back Debecca from the Kurds. Why? At the time, we didn't know. We find out later, and I mean weeks later, that they had no idea the Americans were on the ground. They had believed that it was just an air war that was going on. So they didn't know that these Kurds were being led by special forces or, or anyone at that point. They had no idea there were Americans there at all. And, and during the entire battle, the commander never got the word that Americans were there. And I'll go into why in a second. Okay. So these guys come at us and immediately the Kurds pack up as they, they're used to doing. They, they seize ground in northern Iraq and then the Iraqi tanks show up and they can't fight the tanks. They didn't have the equipment to. So they had to withdraw and retreat. And they pulled back to the intersection behind us with the abandoned tanks, which was on the top of the hill that you couldn't see them once they crossed the peak of the hill. They were on the backside as we're, they're coming at us. One of the team sergeants, Frank Antonori, who wrote the book uh, Roughneck 9-1, he looks up and sees halfway between the, the intersection and where we were at, at the actual Debecca intersection, there was a, a flat ground that you could probably set up a good fight from. And him and my team sergeant both decide on uh, – because they were pretty much taking charge. They were like, we're going to back up to there, and we're going to – we're going to set up and fight from there. At this point, I was already off my vehicle with the clue, which is the command launch unit for the Javelin, uh, at my command at my team sergeant's direction, and I was on the ground waiting for the seeker head to cool down. It takes two minutes from the time you turn on a a, a clue for the seeker head to cool down for the for the uh, for the optics to for the optics to to work. So I'm sitting there on the ground, and I'm literally like sitting on the ground with you know, the launcher tube next to me and the clue in my hands, and I'm watching the countdown. I'm waiting for the beep to come that it's cooled down enough. And I hear all these revving of engines and I turn around and I look behind me and everyone's leaving and I'm sitting on the ground and I'm like, oh. so I get up and I go to turn around and my buddy who was the medic is on the back of this vehicle and note to self, my nickname is Squiggy in the SF units. That's because Squiggy? Like, the Q Squiggy in the Q course when my hair grew long and got like greasy looking for me in the woods, I looked like Squiggy from Laverne and Shirley. So they, they called me Squeaky, and it caught on. Everyone called me that. And I was, at the time, we had just got done with the Q course, and we had a lot of downtime in between. I put on a little bit of weight, so I wasn't lean and, and you know, cut and everything. I was a little dumpy-looking guy because I was on a – I mean, I was on a truck team. We were supposed to be – I was an SF guy. Being fat is what we're supposed to be. So 
I, I get up and all I hear is Gino yell at me, Squiggy, hey, fat, we're leaving. Are you coming? And I run and grab onto the back of the Humvee and get my foot on the on the platform on the back just as they take off. And uh, they're screaming up this road and I am holding on to the back of this thing with a clue in one hand and my hand around a ratchet strap like for, for dear life because the driver doesn't even know why I, was, I wasn't on the vehicle. So he's just going while I'm, I'm hanging off the back of this. And if, for those of you who read the book, there's this whole big story of look, everyone looking over and seeing me hanging for my life off the back of this truck <laughs> as it's coming up because I was off. And there's this whole thing that I – Jeff wanted to stay behind and fight. And it's like, no, man, Jeff just didn't know everyone was leaving. And so Nobody Jeff, talked to Jeff. No one, no one told Jeff because Jeff was a new guy, right? So Jeff, shut up and don't say anything. So Jeff shut up and didn't Roger say back. anything. And he said, yeah, I was like, yeah, you got it. Roger that, Sergeant. And so I finally get on the truck. They get up to this area. We offload there, and kind of, we dug in for for what became the Battle of the Becca. And uh, within within two to three minutes of of setting up, myself and Jason Brown, who was the 18, 18 Bravo on on ODA three nine one, had, had it, both of us had destroyed two vehicles, two tanks, armored Dude. vehicles already. Uh, with Take the us Japanese to that. Wait, that can point. you jump in on that? Can you just kind of like talk <laughs> through? So you set in this position. And yeah. theoretically, you guys probably could have fallen back further, but you don't know we, what's coming at you. Well, yeah, and in, in retrospect, thank God we had not, because because this is where the the history of the battle with Becca comes into play. So we get off the vehicle, and and my and basically for my part, I was the javelin gunner, and my my assistant gunner was my team sergeant who was running the rounds back and forth to me from the vehicle. And one of the things about the javelin missile is it's a it's a fire and forget. Uh, where when when the round goes off from the clue, you are locked into an image of the of the tank that is sent to the warhead, and the warhead is not one of these things where it's heat sinking or anything else like that. And this is not me putting anything out. This is common. This is open yep. source. But it continuously takes photographs of the image that it sees and updates the computer inside the missile as it flies. So as it launches out, it launches up into the air rather than direct attack. So as it goes up and it's taking these photos of its of its original target, as that target changes in perspective, from being a flat square to being a oblong rectangle to being a an, an actual rectangle from above, and as it moves, it can continually update the image and and ride itself in to being a top attack system. So, you fire a javelin missile front front at a T fifty five, T sixty two, T seventy two. It doesn't matter. It's going to damage the vehicle, but it's not going to destroy it. It's just the armor on a tank on the front and the sides is just far too extreme. But all tanks can be destroyed from top very easily. That's why tank, you know, tank mines blow up from the bottom in between the, the you know, the tank. So because that's where the, the armor is the weakest. And so javelin missiles are top. They can be set to do direct attack, which you do for bunkers, or they can be top attack. So. I, we had them at top attack. We la you launch them, and when the tanks see where the launch is, they're all you'll see all the turrets start to move to fire on that position. But you're able to get up and physically run after you fire it to move to another spot. So their ability to see where the rounds are coming from and engage them is limited because you're you're able to be portable. You're moving around, and Where's... we fired them from off the ground, not not on the vehicles. So we okay. weren't on our GMDs. We were we were on foot firing these rounds on, on these tanks but you got a question where, yeah i did where's the so I, I understand the clue portion where is the continuously updating camera that's on the warhead then that's on the warhead itself so the warhead Damn. snaps into the clue it's like it literally looks like a a what would be today like a 3d visor with an eye port that you look through and you hold it like a video game system which is why i think our generation was so good at this so i'm looking through this screen at a digitalized image of the ground that is that is basically hot you know white hot yeah. black hot you know it's thermal and i see and i move they have these these cursors that are just the seeker the seeker cursors that you can adjust and move in to lock into the target and once you have the seekers locked in on the target that you want and you hit this button to to lock it in you get a feedback of the blinking the blinking cursors go solid and they stay and anyone that's played um modern warfare has fired the javelin and i tell people i told my son this uh, son, I have fired a javelin before. That game is exactly like it is when you're when you're Dang, playing the game. It's yeah, legit. And so he's always like, he's like, Dad, play this part, and I'm like, Yeah, yeah, I'm old hat. I've done, I've this, done for this real. Yeah, I've, yeah, video games. <laughs> so 
I get on there and, and, and it's, it's exactly like that. So it locks in the, the, your cursors go solid, letting you know, you've got a good lock. You launch, it has a small charge that launches the, 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 the missile out of the tube. The missile will fly for about two, two and a half seconds. And then it's secondary motor kicks in and it's off. And when it goes off, it shoots out and then up. And so it shoots straight up into the air, which for the tank crews who had never been exposed to these, they see a, a launch happen and it goes up in the air and they're like, <laughs> whatever you missed. And the mental part is the first two rounds I fired, we had been told that it's about five to eight seconds before impact. Right. And I fired the first round, it goes off and me and my team start, instead of getting up and moving, we're totally enthralled in watching this thing hit, you know, like we're on a regular range and we're watching it. And Ken, who was my team star, and he's like, you think we missed? And I'm like, we missed because it had been like 10 seconds. And just as I say the word missed, it hits and it hit that tank and that tank just boom, right in play. I'm like, wow. Woo! And, I, and I'm yelling, I'm screaming, I'm having a great time. And meanwhile, everyone's like, hey, quit celebrating fat. Start shooting again. So, you know, I'm still on an SF team, I'm still being effective in combat, but the the real the reality is, I'm a 26, 27 year old kid still at the time, yeah. and I'm having the time of my life. You know, it's like a video game for me. It was like literally just shooting fish in a barrel kind of thing. And yes, it, it's it's dark because there are people on those vehicles yeah. that were dying, but you don't have that 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 realization at the time. You're, you're just you're just trying to stop these tanks who, FYI, had gotten to within 100 meters of us. Jeez. Before we started firing, before we started firing these things, they they were we were very seriously close to being overrun. And now you've got two, and at this point, Gino, my medic, he started firing javelins because he had been trained up by me. So we have three guys actively shooting these these javelins, and we had I want to say six javelins on each on each vehicle, and we were getting we were starting to get depleted um, on our javelins, but these tanks kept coming, and so this goes back to their commander. He's not getting updates about what's going on because as he sends out a, com a company, they get engaged by us and don't respond to radio traffic because they're either actually engaged or they're no longer there. Yeah. And instead of getting a some kind of a feedback on what's going on out on the battlefield, he just sends another company. So he just keeps sending more to us and they're not coming back. And he, uh, apparently – he just never kind of got the point that there's a reason these guys aren't coming back. So we get air close air support on, on target. Right. And now at this point, we are still just us two teams and the split team from 10th group on target fighting Kurds are gone. So how many They're people the, are we talking, Jeff? Like we, we have 27, 28 guys on the ground, eight Humvees, six Humvees. Cause two of them were displaced. Um, six of these fighting wow. just oncoming waves of, of, of Republican Guard armor over and over again. And close air support gets on station, and it was two F-14 Tom, Tomcats, which immediately I, I, I wanted to grab the radio and see if it was if it was Goose or if it was Maverick, <laughs> but it wasn't. So, um, and, and I'm going to say something that I, I really hope that the pilots out there on here hear what I have to say because I really mean it at, when I say this. So, we have an incident happen. We are getting low on on our on our ammo, uh, and the, I'm talking about the javelin rounds. And and meanwhile, as they're disembarking, we still have our 50 cal's and our Mark 19 gunners are still engaging them too. So this is a full on fight that's going back and forth. And they weren't very accurate with their fire, but they were accurate enough to make you wince when when a tank round went off. I mean, they 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 were they were they were hitting they weren't hitting us. There was no risk it, I think, but. When you're young and that first round comes in, it feels pretty close. Yeah. When the F-14s get on station, um, it was right about the point where they had a very good chance of rolling up the hill and just rolling over us. And they were getting close. And our 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 JTACs, our our, our Air Force attached Air Force guys on the ground, um, they understood the situation and they 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 talk. And this is exactly how the conversation went. Uh, Aircraft, do you see the Humvees on the ground? Yes, I see the Humvees on the ground. Do you see the intersection with tanks? And if you recall my story as I've been going back, there's not one intersection with tanks. There's two. There's one north of us behind us on top of the hill, and then there's one down there with all those guys. We cannot see the abandoned tanks up the hill with all those guys. 
and he says, he goes, verify, you see dismounts and tanks within 100 meters of our position. Yes, I see that. Cleared hot, danger close, go ahead and drop, you're saving our lives. Those pilots look down and they see guys who are begging to be saved. And they see the Humvees, they see an intersection with dismounts, with tanks at it, and they cleared and they dropped. And as they dropped, when they came flying over, we knew right away something was wrong because like they, he dropped that bomb way too late. I'm like, it might land on us for God's sakes, but it doesn't. It goes behind us and goes over top of the hill and explodes. And the explosion was so big that we were like, that was way too big to just be a JDAM. I'm like, those tanks must have still had fuel in them. I'm like, oh, they dropped them on the tanks up there. Immediately from that point, we get called back. Uh, Hey, verify, you dropped them on the empty tanks without dismounts, and they come back negative. Dismounts have been wiped out. And finally, it dawns on us. We're like, oh, the Kurds. And I was a medic, as I said earlier, when I was in Ranger Battalion in the 82nd. I was a weapons sergeant now, but I was a Ranger medic, so I had been through the Q course um, as a medic. Gino, my medic, turns to me, and he realizes what just happened, and he's like, it's the Kurds. And so me and him... And my team sergeant, who was a former medic, grabbed our aid bags because we each had an aid bag because we only had one assigned medic on the team at the time, and that was Gino. And we 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 haul ass to the top of the top of the hill. And first of all, the pilots, they were released from station right on right away because of what happened. Um, and I guess that's just the policy that goes on. But I want those pilots, if they're out there and they hear this, that you didn't do anything wrong. You you literally thought you were saving our lives. Anything, any kind of retribution that they had brought back upon them at the, at this at that time or right afterwards is is undeserved and it's not fair fog of war is one thing but thinking you're doing something because you think you're saving americans lives is something else and they did still save our lives because the iraqi tanks were like what the fuck was that and they kind of backed up and kind of reassessed what was going on but when i came over the hill um and i tell people this all the time that the one thing I will never get out of my head is that is is that the scene that I saw up there. Uh, it was it was the most horrific thing I'd ever seen, and there's nothing that could prepare you for for what I, what we experienced on top of that hill. And one of the things that I noticed right away was these white trucks with with TV written on the side of them that were side turned, and I was like, "What is the press doing here?" I'm like, "Fuck sake, the press! They were up here. I mean, their their trucks are on the side," and I saw John Simpson. From BBC, and uh, if you watch any of the footage, and you can go online and look it up, there is footage of John Simpson's Debecca incident with friendly fire that can be looked up and found. Uh, you will see in the background of that footage a medic working on their interpreter, this guy named Cameron. I never met Cameron um, when he was in a better condition, uh, but I was the medic who worked on Cameron. Uh, he had he had lost his foot, he had broken his femur. Um, but it was a compound fracture that he, he was bleeding out. And uh, two things led to Cameron not surviving. Uh, one thing was just the mass trauma of the of the explosion. Um, I got an IV started on Cameron. I've got I got the everything done on him, but he wakes up halfway through my me treating him and he freaks out and pulls his IV out. And I couldn't get a second one started after that. And we had kept yelling that Cameron needed to get evac right away, but the Kurds had they, they these were guys who were they grew up together. These are people that spend all their time together. Um, they're loading dead Kurdish soldiers in the backs of trucks and offloading them off the battlefield. And that's the second thing that killed them was the lack of time it took to get Cameron to to the hospital. Uh, now, if you listen to John John Simpson's reports, he'll tell you that America killed Cameron, but. I maintain that John Simpson wasn't invited to follow us. Uh, he took it upon himself, and I, I don't fault them for what happened to them because they were trying to do their jobs. But a little less blame in the guys on the ground would would go a long way with the way John Simpson reports the incidents. And he does pay homage to Cameron, and I do feel bad that Cameron died. But as being the guy that worked on him, uh, I I feel responsible for his him not surviving, even though it wasn't my fault. Uh, but there is a responsibility that that does come along with it. And those pilots feel responsible. And then having someone like John Simpson go out there and just always blame America for this um, really doesn't sit well with guys like me and those guys who really did our best in a really crappy situation. I didn't start the war. 
neither did those pilots. We were just doing our jobs. And had they not been there or had had they done a better job of, of letting us know that they were there, we may have not we, – we had thought they all left. But I'm not blaming the victims. I'm just saying that, that it's just it's just it was a yeah. shitty situation for everybody. Uh, we spent four or five hours doing this as we start coming back down the hill after cleaning up. And it was about an hour. Now, the battle is still going on. This battle has not stopped yet. Immediately, one of the we had some resupply runs starting to come out uh, with more javelin missiles. And we had these guys come up to me and they go to hand me an Iridium phone. They said, you need to call home. And I was like, why am I going to call home? We're in the middle of a battle. I mean, we're, we're fighting right now. I'm like, I can't call home. And they're like, no, you need to call home. So what had happened was, do you remember when General Myers and, and Don Rumsfeld used to do their, their daily briefs in the morning? Well, they had gotten on TV and uh, they had heard about the, the, mis the friendly fire incident. Oh. And the reports that came out were that three special forces teams – were hit with friendly fire, JDAM, and there were multiple fatalities. And that wouldn't have been a bad piece of news, except Donald Rumsfeld and his and General and General Myers, not knowing, said the ODA names, not realizing that wives watching knew what ODAs their their their, their husbands were on. So it was ODA 044 from 10th Group, ODA 391 and 392 from Third Special Forces Group were killed in a friendly fire incident this morning that's actively going on right now. So uh, these wives are watching the TV at home. Um, my wife, her story was that she had been woken up by our roommate. You know, she, her friend was living with us while I was gone. Uh, she had been woken up by our roommate with the phone, and she said the, the, the roommate was white as a ghost shaking as she held the phone out. And my wife immediately had thought, uh-oh, right? Uh, the roommate had seen the news report. And when she answered the phone, it was my commander's wife who said, I need to speak with Sarah Adamick. And so she thought she was getting the phone call to say that I was dead. My wife didn't understand it that, but the roommate, I think, she, I think she went through more than, than anyone else did that morning because she was sitting there for like a half hour going, well, do I wake Sarah up? Do I tell her what, what's going on? Um, and the first thing that the, that the commander's wife said um, was, hey, first thing is everyone's fine. And Mark's like, okay, what are you talking about? She's like, uh, have you been seeing the television reports? And she's like, no. She goes, oh, good. Well, she goes, good. Because, but Nothing just okay, um, we're gonna, they're going to have them call you. And the reason why was because immediately some of the older wives uh, started calling bullshit on this. Uh, everyone's fine, no matter what they say on TV. You know, they had gotten into being able to believe General Myers and, and Donald Rumsfeld when they started putting information out. They thought that this was some kind of a friendly fire whitewashing thing going on. So they were really pressuring them uh. to get them proof that their husbands were alive. So they came out on the battlefield and made us call home. So I got this Iridium phone, and I am – I am covered in blood from, from treating all the wounded. Uh, I had just gotten done destroying, I want to say, two tanks and one memorial. I'll tell you about that in a minute. One memorial statue, because I tried to front attack a, 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 an ATV or a, an all-terrain vehicle, but it actually hit this square memorial in the center of the intersection. Instead, it locked onto that. So uh, that went down. And then, yeah, yeah so I got here. I, I'll never, I never hear the end of that with people like everyone got all their javelin hits and Jeff killed three tanks and a memorial statue. <laughs> and so that had all happened. And I, so I was like, Hey, Sarah, I'm like, everything is fine. Um, I'm doing shit. And she was a little concerned at the time. She's like, all right, she goes, you sound okay. And then, you know, fight back into the fight. And uh, that fight went on uh, actively for another two, three hours. We had the, the Fedayeen, those, those um, Saddam supporting terrorist group. Uh, had shown up during one part of the battle when the Republican Guard guys finally kind of saw they were outmatched, and they had started to try to surrender. So we see on the, on the ground, we see them coming out with their hands up, and then we see these white SUVs pull up, and the Fedayeen get out, and they started executing the Republican Guards who were going to surrender. And we we had really – we felt these are uniformed soldiers. Uh, you know as well as I do. There is – even if they're your enemy – um, these aren't Nazis. Uh, these are uniformed soldiers defending their land. Uh, they're honorable. They fought us honorably. There's a brotherhood that's even there between enemies. And we saw what was going on, and we, it pissed us off. So we couldn't do a thing for them when they're getting executed, but we could we could make it over quickly. So the, we had gotten planes back on site at that time while the Fedayeen were out there doing their dirt. 
uh, we just called it another airstrike on them and we wiped everything off the map down there, which, you know, put, put away the guys who were going to surrender. Yes. But they were actively being executed by Fed Ayin at the time. So we got the Fed Ayin also. And, uh, we fought that for another, like I said, it was about another couple hours. Uh, then we stayed there three days and the only, we finally left after they were able to, uh, put D 20 and D 30 artillery rounds on us. And, uh, we were, we were, we had to be pulled back out. Uh, and that was, that was when we started to realize what, what had happened. Um, and because we show back up in Kirkuk at the schoolhouse and like everyone's out there when we got back and like people are like clapping and they're like, well, what, what are we, what's going on? And they're like, man, you're all over the news. Like what you guys did was phenomenal. And it, it was humbling, but it's also a little bit, in, you know, inflating in your brain to have all this stuff come out and then, you know, getting invited to the white house for the next September 11th ceremonies and having general Schumacher pin the silver star that I was awarded on me in, in his office. Uh, it, it was, it was great for, for, to be able to be recognized, especially I give a lot of credit to the command to yeah. not give commanders the awards, but to, I mean, the three guys that got the awards were the three newest guys on all three teams. Wow. So it was me, Jason Brown, and the guy from from uh, from the tenth group, all from that same class, all were awarded the silver star yeah. for it. Um, were you not taking heat from the from the Kurds when you came back um, after no. the friendly fire? No, uh, the Kurds. Uh, we didn't have very much interaction with them because we were kind of mobile. We were kind of just attached to them. Um, I'm sure they were not happy, but I'm, I I also hope that they understand that that it was not. Yeah, you know, we we had thought that we had the pilots thought they were saving our lives. Yeah. It was, it was just, it was, it was one of those things where ignorance and doing the wrong thing, making a mistake doesn't make it better, but it also alleviates it from being just negligence or just absolute, you know, that's why to me, I, I can't ever bring myself to hold those pilots responsible for being the guys. They, they, they saved our lives even by taking those other guys' lives because the Iraqis were even like, well, what the hell? And they just stopped what they were doing because it was such a large explosion and you know that not one american hurt um in that entire thing but you know three silver stars bronze stars with v devices for almost everybody uh, i think more silver stars should have been um awarded gino the medic did not get a silver star and to this day i maintain that he should have uh because as much as i was outside of my element by my mos treating the kurds up on the hill by being an 18 Bravo doing that as a medic, he was outside his element firing a javelin Javelins. and yeah. their argument to me was, well, you trained him on firing the javelin. So his ability to do that was kind of on your good cross training. And I call bullshit on that. I say no, because he applied the training that he willingly listened to. And, and it was, so it was, it was something that put us in, I guess the history books, as far as third group concerned, because we were the first real like silver stars that uh, for third group and the first real battle for third group. But then quickly, as it does and as it should be, um, there were so many more stories of third group guys doing phenomenal things out there, leading up even to Robbie, who won the Medal of Honor and and guys like that. And, and those guys and things that had happened to me later in Afghanistan and Iraq later on, because I had had six deployments total, uh, were far more hair, you know, hair raising than than that situation. But uh, for its time in space, in the time that it was. Uh, it was an event that I'm proud to have been a part of, yeah. uh, even even with the tragedy that that was associated with it. Man, the um, first of all, the fact that you were taking out tanks with a javelin is rare, right? I mean, I'm sure there are many there there are oh, folks who have done. Not if you're Ukrainian. It. Okay, <laughs> at that time, right? Until about two years ago, right? Um, no, that's true. That's very true. But that was a rare thing. I don't even know how many times you would have fired that on a range before you pulled it. Ne never would have. Uh, that my first live javelin round was fired was in a real deal. at a tank. Yeah, and 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 everything I'd done before that was in a simulator on Fort Bragg. Yeah, and there were guys that I'd known who had who had the lucky chance of firing a twenty million dollar javelin. That yeah, because that's how much the round cost is about twenty million dollars. So I mean, in, in the span of forty five minutes. I had spent $60 million of the U S money and that memorial did not deserve that $20 million. It was not worth crazy. the $20 million I wasted on it. <laughs> It'll be interesting one day if you and your son are standing at that memorial or what, what remains of it one day. Well, the, the very it. nice thing is that memorial is no longer there, but there is a memorial for the Kurds um, that right. is there. And, and that I, I would love one day to be able to go back be and, awesome. uh, 
and see and you know because I've seen it on through some of John Simpson's um, reports uh, about that that memorial that's there and and I do feel connected to those people and 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 I I feel a loss from them that that it was no different from some of my some of my brothers that I lost um, not blood brothers but SF brothers yeah, that I lost sure. uh, but I feel the same way about that that I feel that they 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 deserve better but it, it is what it is and. Um, I'm just glad that my 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 daughter gets to exist because she was not even born or heard yeah. of yet at that point. But so we'll, we'll get to just a couple of these hair raising stories. Um, but I would just say for people listening who are like, how would a pilot drop on a friendly position? Um, when, when I was at the career course, I went to the, the maneuver version. So I was like one of the only aviators there with 100 tankers and infantry um, captains. And we would talk about this, like we bring up pictures and show, show, uh, you know, a city. And when you're on the ground in the street, looking at a building, that's all you like, that's your view. But when you're up in the air, it's a completely different perspective and trying to talk right. someone onto a target during the daytime is not easy. It's not no. easy at all. Like a lot of things look the same. It gets very confusing. Um, so I would just say like, it, it's, it's not as easy as it might seem in a video game in that case. Right. Right. Man, for sure. So you come back from that. That's your first rotation. First of all, you mentioned yeah, you do six. That was, you, that's your first. Yeah. And you get yeah. silver star yeah. and you almost die. Um, how are you feeling about your choices at having been a green, green beret coming off of that first deployment? I regret nothing. You know, it's one of those things where, uh, and that, and that goes for everything. Uh, my entire military experience, even, even the, even the way that my military service ended, which was medically retirement for, for uh, injuries and everything. But I regret nothing because uh, for honest to God, the, the best time of my life, best job I've ever had, um, can't beat uh, the, the camaraderie and the, the, the feeling of, of going into a place where you, those guys have your life in their hands and they place their life in yours. And, and the, the bonds that you could not see each other for years and years and years and then run into each other. And it's like, you just picked right back up where, where the last time you spoke was. And, and uh, yeah, I just, I, as much as I don't wish the experience of combat on anybody, I wish that feeling on people of having those kind of, that kind of connection and that bond with people that you don't get any other way. That's so true. Man. Um, for those, for the six total deployments, how many were to Iraq and Afghanistan? I did four in, four in Afghanistan and two in Iraq. Jeez. So you, you mentioned some of the more hair raising moments. Can you take us to one or yeah. two of those? Just like what comes sure. to mind for that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it was my last deployment. So I had, I had done um, four deployments uh, and then a third group gave me a break and made me a Sephardic instructor. And so. Um, Can you explain what, what people, that is? Yeah. I'm gonna, that's I'm a long that. acronym. So, so uh, everyone knows what, SFOD is that that that's listening to your show. Um, so Delta Force is the pre, the premier door kicking anti terrorism hostage rescue unit. But a lot of people don't know that there are there are these companies called or used to have companies called command command uh, crisis interdiction force companies in each in each group and and they were called the SIF company and to go and be in those companies and be like a small detachment of door kickers in a special forces company you have to attend this this school called Sephardic. Um, and it's called Special Forces Advanced Urban Combat or some really, you know, an explosive tactician thing. It's all about building door charges and kicking in doors and how to how to do door room clearing. And uh, each group has the ability to have their Sephardic trained individuals teach a class on to each company. It's like a training cycle class called Sephalic, which is Special Forces Advanced Urban Combat. And I was made a Sephalic instructor. In third group, uh, this is you know four deployments down. I had I had been on a on a mobility team. I had been a I've been on a Halo team. You know, I'd gone to Halo school, so I was a Halo team guy. And I had gone to Sephardic and graduated from Sephardic, which is one of the hardest shooting schools ever. Next to next to the operator training course, I can't think of anyone else that has it tougher shooting wise. And so I was given a break ran with that at the end of that break i was given the opportunity to either go back to a team to start working to become a team sergeant or to work as a special forces uh canine handler because they had just started this program where they the, the multi-purpose special operations multi-purpose canines 
And I love dogs. I, I absolutely just love dogs. So, and I wanted, after all my years of doing stuff, and this is kind of maybe like a lot of my wife always says, this is the liberal coming at me. Uh, I wanted to do something that was more about saving lives than taking lives. And I found that, you know, finding these, these IEDs and everything was not only saving Americans' lives on the ground, but the locals uh, who, who would be exposed to these kind of things. So the big thing about these was this bomb detection capability these dogs did. So coming from the Safal Committee, I just, in the same company, which was a special operations advanced, advanced tacticians company, which you had like a sniper detachment, Safalic detachment, you know, uh, level three detachment, level three intelligence detachment, and then the special operations dog detachment. And me and my senior instructor from the Cephala company, instead of going back to a team, we both moved directly over to this, this detachment, which was going to be the only detachment that deployed. We would go out and attach ourselves to teams as dog handlers, went through the dog training course, got myself a dog, Marco, great, great, best dog ever. And, you know, went out for my, was going to be my first deployment as a canine handler, which ended up being my last deployment in the army. That was this deployment that this hairy uh, situation happened. So now this has nothing to do with the dog, but I just want to give that dog credit. That dog found over 30 IEDs in four months when I was there before I got injured. Um, and multi he saved multiple lives. This dog was fantastic. I mean, I, there wasn't a day that went by. I was at Firebase Cobra in Afghanistan, which if you've ever seen the National Geographic special about special forces guys in Iraq. That's that Firebase. Um, and that hill in that show where the guy dies in that show is where this incident occurred. So we put the dog up and we left him at the firebase. Now, I'm on a Halo team that was at this firebase. Uh, there's nothing better for a team to have an extra SF guy there as a support guy because he's also an extra SF guy. So for this mission, we were going to be out away from the firebase for three, four days. We were being helicoptered in, so we didn't have – the need for the dog to do a movement. And I wanted to give Marco a break because he had been going nonstop. So I left him at the fire base with, with the, with the couple of the guys that were back there, told him to take care of him. I went out with the team and we go out to, to clear this hill, which is notorious. It's called Che Hill. And we went out there to clear this hill because this is commonly where they try to set up fighting positions across the river that we don't have any kind of control over. We get there, we move to the top of the hill um, and on the top of the hill is myself, the 18 Charlie for the team, three infantry guys that were attached to the unit, an interpreter, and on two or three ATVs and one pickup truck was our team commander and a couple guys that were on the pickup truck that were, were the Afghani um, defense forces. We're on top of this hill for like five or six minutes, and what happened at first was I saw a trail of smoke coming from the mountain – which was right next to where this hill was, straight across, right over top of us, and exploded right over top. And if anyone out there knows RPGs, RPGs will go for 600 meters and then self-detonate. Uh, you cannot fire an RPG down at something. When an RPG fires, it will fin stabilize itself into a flat, flat trajectory and just fly straight. So these guys tried to fire down on us, but what happened was it came down and flattened out and stayed up over top of us and then exploded over top of us. And so they kind of gave away their position at that point but they opened on they opened fire on us massively like it was chaos for rounds are coming in all over the top of the hill the guys in the ATVs and the trucks skidded skedaddled out of it and down the hill about 300 meters down the hill was a bazaar and they were able to get into the bazaar and get cover we were on foot me the other 18 charlie the interpreter and the two infantrymen were on foot all we could do at that moment because we were on the other side of the hill from where the vehicles were, was to get down into these hastily made fighting positions that the enemy had dug on top of the hill. And we were in these positions, and every time we tried to stick our heads up out of these positions to get a look around, they sniped at us. And they were they were sniping really close to us. So they, they were in a position, don't know where they were at, but they had us. And this was one of... I'm going to be honest with you, one of only three times in six deployments where I legitimately thought it was over. Like I thought, I thought, I, I thought I was going to die. Uh, because they had you dialed in. They had us, they had us dialed and It felt, it felt and very much probably was them with us at a point. Cause I think they could have shot us at any time. And the reason why I say that is 18 Charlie's name was Chris. 
his radio had been shot during the initial initial fire, so his radio wasn't working. We are laying down in these positions, and I'm the only one who has any kind of contact with the team down in down in the bazaar. And I'm getting feedback from from the team sergeant, who's very much like, "You got to get up and move. You got to get to us, um, or we're going to have to come to you." And that's a long way for them to move to us uphill while we don't know where the enemy is, right? So Chris says, "I'm going to pop smoke." And then we'll wait till it, you know, billows out, and then we'll start to move. He takes out a, a can of smoke and he throws it out there. And as I throw the smoke out there, it pops and starts billowing, and we start hearing a ping. And I look up over the little bit of the ground that I can see, and the smoke canister is popping around as they're shooting it. Jeez. They're letting us know that we can shoot the smoke canister. And I say, Chris, they're shooting the smoke canister. Like it's being shot, bouncing over five feet, being shot, bouncing back five feet. I'm like, this, it's not good. The team sergeant is doing his job. He's like, we're coming to get you. And me and Chris have made the decision that um, we've been up there for maybe five minutes and there's no look at, there's, there's like no color in our faces. And the two infantry guys specifically and the, and the interpreter, they were, they were visually displaying the way me and Chris were feeling inside. Me and Chris inside were like, uh oh. And they looked it. And, and I could see, this this infantry kid who he had maybe he was 18 years old and this kid was petrified and there and he can see and hear in our voices that we don't we're not having much hope for the situation and I, I really wish there are times where I wish I could go back in time and execute a little bit more situational awareness to not allow them to see how hopeless we had felt about the situation because i think it made it worse for them because they're infantry guys they look up to guys like us and yet here's us guys laying there and we are talking to each other as if like well man we had a good run and you know all those kind of things which between sf guys is is morbid humor but to these infantry guys is literally i mean they they don't i can't imagine what was going through their head and i feel bad about it. so if you're out there listening i apologize guys but he finally says we're going to have to make it go because if they start to come and to get us, which is what we think, we thought we were being used as a baited ambush, which is what we were being used for. And I said to Chris, if we have a chance, because then you got to understand that we're all under, we're under mat like fire. They're firing machine guns and everything else. We're still having these conversations, like you know, like while there's rounds kicking up all over the place. You know, I, I think they found like three rounds in the back of my body armor. So I mean, they they were they were they had us. And Chris goes. Maybe because if they're if this is a baited ambush, they're set up waiting for them guys to come to get us. And so the majority of their fire is going to be focused on the space in between us and them and waiting on them. They're looking at them at the bazaar, waiting for them to come out. I was like, if we get up and run for it, maybe we lose 50 percent of us. And I'm like, yeah, that, that sounds about right. I'm like, so you and I will get up first. And he goes, no, the infantry guys get up first. He goes, because if they go to adjust when they get back on, then it's at least you and I that are not moving, you know, and it was, and so I was like, yeah, I don't like that idea, but sure, man, I'm like, I don't like being the one that I know is going to get shot. But so we tell them, hey, look, we're going to go on three. And me and Chris had made a decision that we were going to do a half count after they started to go. And then we were going to get up and run after them so that we were the ones that they kind of saw. Uh, if you can follow what I'm saying, it's like, oh, they, yeah, they man. Move and yeah, you're like, attention. we're going to take the hit. Yeah, we're going to take the hit kind of thing. And then neither me or Chris liked the idea, but it was it was what we, you know, looking at their face, I'm like, I got to get these kids home. You know, I, I can't I can't live with myself if these kids die in this hill because I just felt responsible. I felt responsible for the for the way that what the, the look in their faces, um, the fact that they looked up to us. You know, they were there to support us. But you know how it is, man. You feel responsible for them. How and old is your son at this time? Probably. I think my son was just about to enter high school. First time yeah. on a deployment, this deployment, I was getting ready to leave. First time my son cried at the tarmac when I was leaving. Every deployment before that, he just didn't understand. So he didn't, you know, have that. But this is the first one where my, where I look at my son as I'm leaving and he's, he's bawling. And he, I had to go back to him and be like, hey, you know, I had to do the whole, hey, you're going to be the man of the house kind of thing. And, and, and I, I'm in this moment thinking to myself, and th this is, I came here to save lives with the dog and, and I, I'll be honest with you, there was a feeling in me, I don't know if it was the multiple deployments, the continually pressuring, pushing the envelope and putting myself in, in, in those situations. I kind of had a feeling that this deployment, if I was ever going to get really hurt, 
that it might be this deployment. So there's a moment there where I'm like, here it is. We get them up and they go to move and they run. As the one kid gets up, his Oakleys fall off his head on the ground. Uh, what goes through my head, and this is weird, man, but what goes through my head is, man, we get Oakleys all the time, but that infantry guy doesn't. He doesn't. I'm not going to, I'm going to make sure I get his Oakley for him. So I get up <laughs> and we go to run and I run over, grab this kid's Oakleys and then run the Mogadishu mile. And I'll tell you what, man, I told you, I'm not a good runner. That was hard to run. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, my heart never was pounding so hard, not because I was afraid, but because I never ran so fast. And we get all the way, and we're running zigzag patterns. And I don't know if they were shooting at us or not, but <laughs> it felt like, you know, they were just waiting. We barely make it into there before, like, the whole wall behind us as we get into the bazaar erupts with fire that they're getting ready to fire on us. Everyone gets back to the bazaar safe, which to me at that point was like, oh, shit. And I walk over to this kid who he's bent over and he's you know, puking up his guts because he was running so hard. I said, hey, man, you drop these. And he grabs them and just flings them across the thing at the wall like, fuck those glasses. And I get this look on my face like they said that his – sergeant who was there went and made him come apologize to me later and he was like man i know you must have stopped to get my glasses I, i'm really sorry that i just flung that to the side and i'm like yeah i fucking i wanted to die for your oakley's brother i'm like and you just fling them to the side oh, and he's man. like yeah you understand i'm like yeah i do at the time he had just gotten back and note to self the interpreter left his weapon up there oh, when we came back no. so guess where we had to go back to get but the the, the, the team start was like Chris, Jeff, you guys are not going back up that hill. And we were like, no, we got to go. They're like, no, we're going to go get his weapon since he left it there. And that interpreter felt so bad, but it was like, you know, it, his, his, R, his, his U.S. issued, he was a Cat 3 Terp, so he had a U.S. issued M4. We're like, that weapon is going to end up being used on Americans if we don't go get it back. We went back and got it. We, re, we retook the hill later that day. But, uh, yeah, there was that. That, that happened, uh, I want to say, three weeks before I was injured. Uh, and got medevaced out of Afghanistan. And that was, uh, in and of itself, that was the hairiest, um, probably one of the clothes, like I said, one of only three times where I was convinced in in the moment that, that it was all over. That, you know, that's a surreal discussion to have with another human of, all right, like, we're going to take the shot if somebody's got to get killed. Right. Um, did you guys reflect on that? Reflect is the wrong word because I feel like in combat, nobody's reflecting on anything. But no, like afterwards, no. you say like, what the hell were you thinking, man? Why did Absolutely you say not. that? Absolutely not. I think it was one of those things where neither me or him wanted to admit that we would make yeah. such such a horrible self-decision. You know, it's like like going back to that whole having no, no, you know, no care of your own safety or security kind of thing. Uh, I think we, and also that was a very high, high tempo deployment at firebase cobra if anyone knows anything about the history about firebase cobra it was a very active location in afghanistan much like the Korangal valley and so it was we just didn't really have time to reflect on a lot of things uh, of the three times i felt like things were going to be over two of them happened in that deployment alone so uh it was a very very fast tempo to really didn't have time to think uh operational environment and so we really didn't have much time like the second we got done with one thing we had to move on to something else and so funny story my daughter right now her boyfriend in high school is the son of one of those guys on that team no way <laughs> so, yeah it was really weird he, they, they both go to high school together and uh oh, me and me and him uh would sit at football games because he's on the football team my daughter's a cheerleader and we knew that each other were there and we'd be like hey uh and then uh, my – and I remember sitting there with my wife, my, my daughter's first year of cheerleading, and I'm looking at all these kids in the field, and I knew it was his son. I'm like, you know what? My daughter's probably going to end up dating one of these clowns, and you know, you have to get that hole where you're coming to grips with your daughter dating. And I'm like, as long as she doesn't date him, I'll be okay. No more than two weeks later, hey, this someone asked me out. I'm like, who was it? She's like, so-and-so. I'm like, God. And no matter how much I try to hate that kid, I can't. I love him to death. He's a great uh, of kid. Of course so. not. Yeah. Dang. So, Man, you, um, you alluded to – not alluded, you mentioned TBI, medically retired, and you mentioned getting blown up not too far, yeah. too, not too long after this incident. Yes. Um, and I was, I was assuming during this story that this is where you got blown up. No, the, what the happened on that I, event? Yeah, that event was a, another multi day. This time we were, we were out there. My dog was with us, but he was in the truck when this happened. We had gotten a ambush, like a, like a, 
real quick ambush as we entered this village and there were some tires shot out of a vehicle. And so we had to stop and wait for the, the people to change the tire. And it was actually my vehicle. One of our tires was shut out. So we changed the tire, right? As we're changing the tire, the rest of the team says, hey, we're just going to move to the far side of this small little hamlet and just secure the far side. No big deal. Still, still line of sight, eyes on. There was nothing really going on. Uh, there was a wadi system that kind of surrounded this village. But we had, we had uh, UAV coverage, and they said, hey, there's no one in the wadi. So we felt pretty secure, took my body armor off, took my helmet off, changed this tire, and, you know, my dog's up inside the vehicle, and they kick off another ambush. Uh, and this is right as we get done with, with, uh, with getting the tire changed. So I've got no – I got a hat on backwards like I do right now, no body armor on. Um, this ambush kicks off. They had come around the wadi system behind us, and they started firing on us from the wadi system. Uh, I get on the back of the vehicle, and on the back of the Humvee was a mounted 240. And I am on the back of the 240, and the same guy who had the the sunglasses incident that threw the sunglasses was gunning for us. So he's up on the gun, the 50 cal. And we're engaging, and I remember hear him saying, "There's someone moving to our flank in the in in the wadi." And I see the head bobbing along, but we're getting actively engaged from one location. So I. I keep engaging, and as I keep looking over my in my peripheral, I can see the guy's head pop up a couple times. And the last time his head pops up, I see the RPG come up with him. And the last thing I remember was saying, "Oh," as he fired it, and it had hit the 240 that I was gunning. It hit the it, weapon. It, in yeah, your it hand? hit the it, yeah, it hit the 240. The front of the 240 got hit, so it hit and piezoelectric warhead detonated in place. I get thrown off the vehicle. I land on my head. And the vehicle pulls forward because, you know, the driver feels the hit and he immediately hits the gas. So he doesn't get too far away. I want to say about 50 meters, but there was about 30, 40 seconds, I think, that I was out of it. And I landed totally on my out. head no, with no helmet. Um, I've got little itty bitty pieces of shrapnel in me. Um, I land on the ground. Uh, I don't. Here's the weird thing. I did not feel like there was anything wrong on my back at the time. That's that's an important point. But I get up and I try to engage the enemy, and apparently I was just shooting directly into the ground in front of me. So I, I, I had a, there was a head injury there. You know, I was, and they had identified that quick. There was another member of the team who had been shot in the knee on that same thing. So me and him both get medevac from there. Um, as they're trying to medevac me in the bird, Marco, my dog, is eating the, J, the, the medic in the bird while he's trying to work on me because he's trying to give me an IV and I'm all out of it. The dog is, and he's like, "Could you do something with the dog?" And I barely get, <laughs> barely get the muzzle on Marco. We get to the firebase where to the where the field hospital is. Uh, the SF team that was there takes Marco to their to their operation center. They take me in. Uh, they do a great job. They got my wife on the phone right away. Made me talk to her so that hey, we're medevacking him. He was injured, but here's your husband's voice. And it was very surreal, much like the first call, except this time she could tell that there was something something was amiss she knew you like she knew you better than anyone like she'd known you right, for a okay. long time yeah. she, she, could tell she absolutely knows stuff. yeah she knows my she knows what i'm gonna do before i know what i'm gonna yeah. do um so she could tell by the sound of my voice that something was amiss um but she asked me like point blank are all is everything still there like do your legs your arms and because yeah. i had always made jokes that if anything below the waist ever went i wanted them to let me bleed out because i just did i was like i used to tell medics don't feel like you need to save me if my junk is gone do not, because I will not be happy with you as a person if you <laughs> save my life when I've got nothing in my crotch. So she asked, she's like, everything there? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, no, no, not just you like this. Everything there? And I'm like, yeah, everything's there. And I'm like, you got you. I'm like, I see what you're worried about. She goes, no, no, no. She goes, I'm worried about dealing with you without. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, things are fine. <laughs> so I get to the fire. I'm there for like a couple hours. And then in walks the team again to check on me. I think they're just checking up on me. And they're like, hey, Jeff, man. He, you miss Marco? Do you want him? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, bring my dog over. They're like, oh, good, because he destroyed the operation center. Like they had left him in there, but here's my dog. I mean, this is the the bond between a dog and a handler is very strong. And and dad has been stripped away from me, and I get locked in a room with a bunch of people I don't know. And I'm a I'm a working dog. I, I am trained to patrol and bite people. And he destroyed their entire – I mean they brought in like their laptops to show me that had bite marks in it, and he was ripping paper off the wall, freaking out. 
they bring him in, they set him down with me, and he was completely fine. And oh, they met back me back to Kandahar, where when I get there, there was a Dutch doctor who said he didn't want the dog in the hospital. I said, by all means, take the dog. He looks at the dog. The dog growled at him. He said, never mind. And he left the dog there with me. <laughs> I get you know, medevac. They have to take the dog away from me because I got to get medevac to Germany. And that's when I got to Germany. I, now, I've been on a stretcher for a week now. I get to Germany, and there was – I personally believe there was a lot of getting guys off of a stretcher within the first 10 days, a little bit because they want to make sure you're good, but a little bit because they don't want to pay that that SGLI. If you're considered yeah. inpatient for 10 days, they have to pay you $500,000. So I'm at day eight right, of being an inpatient. They're like, well, we're going to treat you outpatient here. Um, so we want you to get up off the gurney, and uh, we're going to take you to a room that's in the hospital, but you'll be considered like inpatient, outpatient. I get up, and I take like four steps and completely collapse on the ground because my back had been broken in four places also during oh. the throw, which I didn't know about. Um, and they didn't know about either, huh? They didn't know. They, they were so focused on the head injury, which was oh you know, severe God. enough that they just didn't realize. They had sent me in for a CAT scan, uh, an MRI inside the yeah, – an MRI. And while I'm in the MRI, I start getting all these – hot prickly feelings and then all this pieces of shrapnel that were in me oh. start sucking out and connecting into the inside of the MRI machine, which as I looked around, there were all kinds of marks on the inside of the MRI machine from other guys that this has happened to. So they come out and they're like, Hey, at least we got all the shrapnel out. I was like, That's yeah, thanks. Awesome. So th there was that I got home and, and uh, you know, quickly uh, I started working in, in some, in jobs while I'm recovering, I'm working in like a desk job and everything. And it, it just, uh, PTSD started to rear its ugly head. Um, a lot of, you know, survivor's guilt and, and guilt with having to come out early. And the fact that, that I was still a member of that culture that believed that, you know, the signs and symptoms as you see them are considered weaknesses if you bring them up. So I had ignored certain things for too long. It, it, significantly, the biggest one was the feeling of being, of being there felt more normal than normal. being at home which is what i tell people now this should be a big a big warning sign and so ptsd roots ugly head i quickly by my wife telling me uh you're gonna get help yes. she goes because there's far too many people committing suicide she goes uh, your mom was an alcoholic i don't want you diving into a bottle um uh, i was on pain meds which were quickly becoming a little bit too much too easy to too easy to take so i get treated for ptsd uh and it, it just, they just, they wanted to medically retire me. It just, and it was time. And it was 18 years in service. So two years from my 20. Amazing. And I'm like, wow. yeah, and I'm like, man, I don't want to be medically retired. I want to do 20 years. And then somebody sits me down and goes, if you get medically retired, you're going to get retired at the percentage of your disability. And at this point, I realized that I was severely disabled. You know, that I, I had back problems. It wasn't going to go away. I had traumatic brain injury, the PTSD. I'm like, I'm fairly certain I'll hit that 70%. Um, like 70% retired is a lot better than the 40% I was getting because I was a 1995 joint uh, guy who joined. So I only was going to get 50 and I had taken a redux at 15 years. So I was going to be dropped down to another 10%. So I was only going to get 40% of my initial retirement. So my wife had convinced me, she goes, look, getting out and start working on your next career. She goes, you're never going to do more than 20 years anyway. She goes, you're not disappointing anyone. She goes after, you know, as many deployments as you've done, the things you've done, there, there's no need to feel you know, there's no need to to feel bad about it. So, yeah. I, I let them go through with the with the process, and, and I'm glad I did because it, it allowed me to get out right when I hadn't let PTSD become too too much of a hold on me. And, and although I suffered for some years dealing with things and getting around, getting over some stuff and past some things, uh, it was the best thing that could have happened to me at that time because it I, I just had the I had the support structure. Uh, I'll get emotional about this sometimes, but I, I can't say how much how important it was for my wife to be the person she was because yes. I, I would not be sitting here today. If it not no was for that woman, there's no way because um, just the way I feel about her, how much I love her and just how much she knows me and how much she stood by me over all those years. Again, only knew each other six months. Both were 18 years old. That's crazy. Get married SF and Rangers. The, the odds are against someone. And six you know, now, we're, now we're married more yeah. than 25 years. You know, two kids, and and you know, I, I couldn't be happier with with her as my wife. So, man, I've I've often talked to to guys on this show. the The woman in your life is a huge determinant in the direction you sure. go in your career. Like, if you don't Absolutely. have somebody who's in it and and willing to 
to be woken up at 2 a.m. with like talking to you while you're getting shot at. Yeah. You, yeah. You just can't make it. Yeah. So she probably deserves her own silver star for this. One of the no, things she, I wanted... she deserves a medal of honor. For it. If, if there was one for wives, she definitely deserves it. Um, I wanted to ask, cause we had Derek Natalini on here, a Delta operator who has TBI and he was, it was the only person that I know of, um, with TBI. And he was kind of talking a little bit about how it shows up for him. How does it show up for you day to day? If at all, I don't need, I don't know. Oh, no, no, TBI no, it does. Well. So at, at first I had, I had problems, um, first of all, with, with my, my ability to speak. Um, so like I would hear somebody say something and I would respond to them. But what came out of my mouth was a little bit garbled. Um, but to me, it sounded fine. So there was that. Um, I, I did have memory loss stuff. Uh, one of the instances I tell people about is um, during about the first three or four months, once I was able to move around, um, once my back was healed up, and it still was very bad, but I was still able to, to like drive places and go places. I get up and get in uniform. I leave to go to work. And... I'm honest to God, two hours later, my wife's on the phone with me as I'm sitting in a food line parking lot. And she's like, what are you doing? Where are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm at food line. I was like, I'm picking up a can of Copenhagen on my way, on my way to work. And she's like, it's Saturday morning because you've been gone for three hours. Things like wow. that would happen, you know, where I, I guess I sat there trying to figure out what am I doing here? Um, why, where am I going? Um, I had, I don't know, and I tell a lot of people this, to not get confused and to not feel like PTSD and TBI aren't somehow connected. I think they are because I don't know if some of the, the anger and, and depression and, uh, you know, emotional ups and downs of kind of like a pregnant woman's kind of emotional up and downs. I had a lot of that stuff. I would come, I would come home man, and go into the bathroom and just weep for an hour and a half for, for not, nothing happened. It would just happen. It would just, and I don't know if that comes from that, that clicking from being a very self-confident, you know, I, I board, I tell people tell me all the time, I really ride that line of arrogance and confidence. Um, but I ride it on the side of confidence where it's some people like me because of it. I'm not one of those guys that people don't like to be around because I'm too arrogant, but it changed. I became very, I used to be someone that would go out and like to be around people. And now that's not the case. And I, big crowds and everything. And it's not a PTSD thing. This is definitely a TBI thing. It's the sensories become overwhelming sometimes. So uh, that, that's that been something that I have really bad headaches every once in a while. I'll have a, a really good migraine about once a month, not as bad as it was when I was going through it. I got put into the program of treating TBI when you still could get better from it if it was treated early enough. And I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, and you know this, we used to be told that head injuries and, and brain damage could never be recovered from. And it was something that you, you had it, you had it forever. And the one thing as terrible as the war is, the one thing we learned from this war is how if you treat somebody a certain way, the right way early enough, that you can recover from some things. And my memory, believe it or not, is far better today because I have certain ways that I can memorize stuff. I've graduated college since then. Um, I'm able to do, I'm able to do multi, I'm able to multitask far better than I ever did. And that's not because I've become better. I don't have a superpower. It's because of the tools and the things that I've been given in the recovery process and the, and the way they treat TBI that I've been able to apply those things. So, and, and I mean, it sounds like you're pretty highly functioning in the workforce, right? So we, we didn't really touch on it here, but you became yeah. a network engineer, like you're in the tech sector. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I was I was hired, and because I was a, the the man that hired me was a former veteran from the Navy who was very good at hiring veterans. Uh, and I I had gotten out. I had done the the standard go contract as a special operations guy overseas for one deployment. Um, but it was just as a training NCO, so our training guy. So I didn't go over and do any kind of uh, you know operation stuff. Uh, I didn't really enjoy that. I didn't like that feeling of not of being the guy that used to be a team guy. Yeah. And so I realized that that was going to be something that was going to be detrimental to my recovery. So I, I walked away from that and I got a job at the Department of Homeland Security as an anti-terrorism officer. And it was in Chicago. And my, I, me and my wife had always said that we were never going to make our kids. Her being a army brat, she never got to have the kind of friendships with friends from high school that I had because she had moved from school to school so much that we had decided long ago that we were never going to make our kids move like that. We were always let them graduate from the schools they, they started at, which is why I love staying at Fort Bragg. 
my son had been in high school. My daughter was getting ready to start middle school. I said, I'll go be, a, I'll go work there and come home on weekends because the pay was pretty damn good uh, for this job. But I just realized quickly that no matter how much money you make, you can't, if you're not happy. And I just didn't like being away from my family like that. So I gave that up. I came back, went to school for IT stuff, was lucky enough to get, to get a very, a very well-known um, IT company picked me up and quickly they learned about what I, who I was and what I had done. And they asked me if I was interested in, in, in management and leadership positions. And I said, yes. And you know, now I am a, uh, I'm a America's for the whole continent. Um, one of the managers of the logistics section of the, of the company and, and the sky's the limit. Uh, I, I couldn't be happier. I'm doing great with that. Like I said, with my, with my podcast show that I yeah. run and I feel very lucky and very fortunate to have had the experiences I had, and that even includes the injuries and the suffering that I've gone through, because I wouldn't be the person I am today without them, and I wouldn't have the kind of worldview that I have without them. You know, I think that I don't wish injuries on people or that kind of stuff, but failure has been a bigger uh, lesson for me, and not being able to do certain things has taught me how to adjust and live my life in a way where I'm, I have to be happy with what I'm able to do and focus on those things and then focus on helping others. And so that that's where I'm at in life right now. And it, I, I think it's, I couldn't be happier with how things are going for me. So where, where's the podcast come from for you? So when I had been, yeah, I was doing, um, I had been reached out to and asked to do public speaking because of my story about you know, recovering from PTSD and all that kind of stuff. And there was a podcast that had, had me on and I just had a great time on it. And they had kind of encouraged me. They're like, man, because they didn't know about me being, you know, performing arts background and stuff. They're like, man, you really like, you really speak well. You, you're able to hold an audience. You, you know how to tell stories. Or like, have you ever thought about doing this? And being that I couldn't be a history teacher because there's no pay in it. Um, I was like, why don't I do a history, like a history class, my own history stuff, being that it's military and that I know a lot about it. I started doing that. One of the fans had come on a couple of times and me and him had good banter. He's from Boston, has no military experience, but the guy knows a lot about history. So he's become a good friend of mine via the podcast. That's and awesome. I just started doing the podcast and it started having people listen to it. And so I've, I've been doing that now for four or five years and it's, I'm not busting down and breaking any records, but it's something that I enjoy doing. It's, it's something that's a hobby of mine that I go out there. I've got listeners. I've got people who, who treat me like I'm some kind of a media personality. And I do get really, sometimes I've had Dale Dye on my show. I've had uh, authors and people who, I had the guy who was the military rep for the movie 1918 on my cool. show. And so it, he reached out to me to come on, which I thought That's was cool. Awesome. So I've had a lot of good success and some really cool things go down because of that. And I've uh, really had a great time doing it. And then again, uh, like speaking with you, if I wasn't somebody that recently got, not recently, but got into podcasting, and stuff like that. I probably never would have even heard about you to know to know to reach out to you. So I mean, it, there's been nothing but good things going on with it, and I still participate in veterans outreach programs for you know anti suicide and and PTSD you know recovery as much as I possibly can, and and make that a priority in the times that I have when I do have time to do it. So that's awesome. So for people who had not heard your podcast before, is there a somewhat recent episode you might point them to, to get them started? Sure. Well, there's two, there's two episodes I tell people, and I, I've actually made these two episodes my number one and two, just because I always say you can start from the beginning, but I do a history of nuclear warfare, which is called, uh, mutually assured destruction, that episode, which I think is episode one or two. And then there's an episode that I do that's about the uh, about the Marine Corps in Korea, about the the Chosen Res Reservoir. And, and those two episodes are are the two episodes I tell people listen to, and because those are the ones that I think I put the most effort into. I did, those were solo episodes that I did, uh, and I did a lot of uh, like audio, and it learned, that's where I learned how to edit and learned how to do all that kind of stuff. And it's very narrative and storyline based, and the. The mutually assured destruction one is great because it opens up with the emergency broadcast system alarm going off saying that North Korea has launched nukes. And I've had people tell me I was driving in my car and I just started the podcast and I thought it was an actual emergency got on. And like it kind of freaked me out at first. But then I realized that what the name of the episode was and I got stuff like the the turtle, the turtle com commercials from back when we were kids. 
you know, duck and cover commercials yep. that all that kind of audio is in there. So it, that, that's the ones I tell people to go to. And, and okay. it, you know, there's, there's every episode's its own thing. So it, there's no, you look through the, the episode names, you find a subject you like, go in there and, and go at it. And I always tell people, reach out to me if you have an idea for a show you want to hear and I'll do one on it. That's perfect, man. So there's two questions I ask everybody. You've already answered one of them, which is, would you go back and do it again? And you've, you've certainly said like you would do that again, but the other one is, is there anything you carried with you into combat that had sentimental value, something that somebody gave you that you wanted to have on you? Yes. Yeah. I, I had, I had been given a, uh, I was, I grew up Catholic. Um, and I had been given a, um, a rosary that was like an Irish rosary. My, my last name is, is a adopted last name. I, I'm actually Irish by, by heritage. So it was a Irish, you know, rosary beads that that and my wedding ring, even though it was not my finger, were both put together and on me at all times in every single operation I did from the very first one to the very last one. And so, and, and I wear this wedding ring, but the wedding ring that I wore in combat is not out, or this wedding ring, I'm sorry, where's this wedding ring, but the, the wedding ring I actually wore in combat is locked up with the rosary beads away so that they, they're kind of, that was what they were for. And, and... That's cool. Man, Jeff, this is super fun, man. I, I'm really appreciative of your time. I think you're going to get some new listeners to the podcast. Um, just, oh, great. There's, a, there's a good Venn diagram here with what we're doing and uh, people who just love that, that uh, historical perspective of the military. Thanks for sharing. You are very, sure. you, you do keep people very engaged, man. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it, buddy. And then, and, and God, man, I can't, anytime you want to come on my show and, and do a subject that you're, you're interested in, let me know. Love it. Thanks, man. I hope you enjoyed that combat story. Wanted to take a couple of listener comments. We've got one on YouTube on the Jason Lilly part two from J Hill 405. He says, ah, this was so great. Thanks for coming back again, Jason. And thank you, Ryan, for giving the people what they wanted. You always do and more. You've really hit your stride on Combat Story and your natural style is really smooth as hell. I always look forward to new episodes. Yeah, that, that one with Jason to me was, was really important. We had planned in advance that we knew we weren't gonna get through everything that he had done um, in just one episode. So kind of left off where we had a good break between the you know the beginning and then getting into more of the MARSOC and um, CIA time that he had. So I'm glad you guys appreciated it. He's, he's an easy one to listen to, just great storyteller uh, with just some hilarious uh, experiences to share. So thanks for that. Uh, the next two are about the Danny Hernandez interview, both YouTube comments from two different folks. First is from Gun Websites, it says, I look forward to your interviews each week. Episodes like this one are why. Thank you for preserving these stories in the words of the men and women who live them. And then the second also on Danny Hernandez is from Jam One, it says, outstanding warrior and true American patriot. Salute to you, sir. Thank you, Ryan, for such a great show. I'm never disappointed. And uh, I think it's episodes like Danny's, who um, is a Vietnam veteran that really shows who our core audience is because these are the ones that aren't going to get the hundreds of thousands of views but they're the ones that our audience really loves to hear they want the variety and it comes through in the comments so really appreciate it y'all you know what danny sacrificed for so long and for those who listen to it you know he went three decades not knowing he was awarded a particular medal so to what he's done for his community and then what he did when he was in combat is really special so thanks for recognizing that and for your support for this show couldn't do it without y'all thank you so much stay safe